All right, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Cliff Gilley. I'm here to talk to you about culture change and why it can be such a struggle. A uh, quick bit about me, I've been a product manager for about 15 years or more actually. Um, I've done work in a wide variety of different, different companies, different sizes, different industries. Uh, I worked for LexisNexis for a long time, gigantic international conglomerate, all the way down to about a 200, uh, no not even 200, about a 75 to 125 person startup. Um, my primary experience is with business, business to business, um, but I also believe strongly that a good product manager can go across those paths. Can you get a little closer to the yes, I can. All right, how's that? Is that better? Okay. Uh, ah, all right. I gotta look at my, I gotta look at my slides sometimes. Okay. Uh, so I'm currently a technical product manager at a company called uh, K2 Source Code, uh, not K2 the ski company, although that's why I had the source code on there. Uh, we do business process automation for large enterprise organizations. Uh, the company's been in business for about uh, 18 years, originally out of South Africa and moved to Bellevue, Washington. I'm also a blogger as The Clever PM, um, which I hope someone out there has read my blog. Um, <laughs> I started that blog about four years ago now um, just to talk about different topics that are related to agile, product management, project management. Um, it kind of keeps me uh, engaged with the community. I'm also the vice chair of our product management community organization in Seattle, Washington, where, which hosts our product camp and does workshops and events related to product management. Um, I am a huge believer in Agile. Uh, you'll hear a lot about that. Um, I believe in little a Agile, not big A Agile, which is a very interesting discussion, which will be for another day. Uh, and I am a gamer and a horror fan. So if you want to talk horror movies afterwards, uh, feel free to tag me. So the first question that always comes up uh, when we're thinking about what culture is and how we want to change it and what the challenges are is what actually is culture? And do not read this. I, I intentionally put this gigantic word salad up here because this is what you usually see when you find look for definitions of what a company culture is. It's big, it's long, it's got a lot of words, and it really doesn't say a lot. Um, <clears throat> in looking for a definition to use, uh, this is actually just straight out of Wikipedia, but in looking for a definition that I wanted to use, um, I found something that was a little bit still word salad -y, but there's two really, really key things in this gigantic word salad uh, from the Harvard Business Review uh, that I think is, is super important when we're talking about culture. And that is, culture tells us how to respond to an unprecedented service request. Culture is not about the things that we do on a regular basis that's predictable, that's our habits, uh, to use uh, some words from the previous presentations. Um, culture really shows itself when we're faced with something new something different, um, when we're challenging ourselves. That's when our culture shines through. The other thing that's important here is that culture tells us what to do when the CEO isn't in the room, right? Culture isn't what happens when you're in a work environment where HR is looking over your shoulder, making sure that you're actually having diverse candidates and all that sort of thing. Culture is what happens when HR isn't in the room. Culture is what happens when people aren't paying attention to you, aren't there to vet, your, vet what you're doing and how you're doing it. Um, again, this is kind of word salad-y, but and yeah, it's a mnemonic device. I can, I can tell you how I came up with that one. Um, I really think there's five things that define culture to me. Um, one is your actions, your beliefs, your opinions, your values, and your ethics. And I, I created this mnemonic device because it helps people to remember. Um, but if you think about ultimately the things that define uh, our company culture, our individual culture, our organizational culture, our uh, relationship culture. It is these five things. It's the things that we do, it's the beliefs that we hold, it's the opinions that we either speak or hold to ourselves, and most, most of all is our values and our ethics. And I'm going to just look at this. The other important thing is it's, it's also in how we communicate with other people, right? It's how, it's how we uh, build that rapport and that experience with another person or another orga another organization. I put together a few examples and I will caution you, I will try not to use the word good when describing a culture because good is a value statement um, and not all cultures are good for all people and not all good cultures are, are good fits for people. Um, there's some examples here of some places that I would probably never want to work, but they are successful and they do have a very strong culture. 
So the first one up here is Zappos. Is it, everyone's familiar with Zappos as a company, I'm sure. Um, has anyone ever actually visited the Zappos offices? It's a really awesome place. They actually have a role in the organization called the Fungineers, who exist solely to do fun and weird things. At one point, they brought in an actual camel for a hump day celebration. An actual physical gigantic camel walked through the, walking through the offices. Those are the kinds of things that Zappos does. They live and breathe that fun and weird idea, that fun and weird dynamic. And it permeates everything that they do within that organization. Um, Buffer is a company that I came across in my research for this. They practice extreme transparency. Every single employee at that company knows the salary and benefit makeup of every other employee there, from the CEO all the way down to the, the support rep. They can find out what, how much someone makes, what, what stock options they have. Everything is open. That's an amazing thing for some people, and it's a very scary thing for others. Um, Amazon, everyone is obviously familiar with Amazon, and hopefully their leadership principles, right? Their frugality, uh, the bias towards action, uh, the customer obsession. Um, I, say, I say Amazon as, as one of those places with a strong culture, because I also know many people that don't fit in that culture. Um, it's a very stressful culture. It's very results-oriented. Not, it's not for everyone, but it's a strong culture. Uh, Southwest, Southwest Airlines, right? They're employee-owned. That's an aspect of their culture that allows them to focus on smaller things than m many airlines might look over. Uh, and Google, uh, how many, has anyone ever been to the Googleplex? It's a really weird place. It doesn't look or feel like an office at all. There's random places to work, there's beanbag chairs, there's slides. Uh, it's a really, really odd place, it's unconventional. And that's one of the things that Google does uh, as part of its culture. And lastly, my company, K2. Uh, we have a very strong belief from the top down uh, that the individual matters at K2. We, we are the company. The company doesn't exist without us. Uh, and that's a message that's delivered at each and every event that we have that it's super important that we recognize that we're the ones making the changes, not someone else. So that's really great. The fun thing, I, it, it's hard to try to think about what your culture is sometimes. So, the thing that I would challenge you with is, can you name or describe the culture of your organization in five words or less? Is there anyone here that th thinks they can? <laughs> what, what? Interesting. That's kind of cool. It's, it's the singular and the plural all in one. That's really cool. Um, I think most people, this is a struggle for most people um, because we don't really think about what our cultures are on a day-to-day -day basis. So why does it matter, right? I've just, talk, I've just given you some examples of companies that have certain cultural values. Um, culture, va <laughs> culture matters um, because it helps us to build camaraderie, right? If we have a strong culture, if we have a set of shared values, then the people that are all working toward the same goal have a level of trust and respect in each other. We know what to expect from someone else in the organization. If you have a weak culture, that can be, a, that can be highly unpredictable, and it's much more difficult to build an attitude of trust and respect going forward. Um, it encourages collaboration and cooperation. Again, shared values driving towards the same goals. Everyone wants to help each other out. In companies with weak cultures, you'll see a lot more competition than you'll see cooperation uh, because there isn't that shared North Star. And mentoring and empowerment. I am a firm believer <laughs> that as a product leader, it's my job to mentor other people, both within my organization and outside. Um, I also think that within a, within a strong culture, those mentoring and empowerment uh, activities simply happen. They don't have to be planned, they don't have to be scheduled, they don't have to be part and parcel of an overt process. They simply happen in the background, um, again, because of the shared values. And it's more than just work. Um, our culture doesn't just define what we do within the four walls of our organization. If you have a sh shared set of values, if you have a shared set of beliefs, that will leak out into the, into the real world. So. Um, Connections between people. If we have natural affinities toward a, a similar goal, we're going to naturally build relationships with those people. The 
strongest culture companies that I've worked with have almost always had people coming back to them and or you know, meeting up old coworkers for happy hours, right? Either before work, after work, meeting for lunches. Those kinds of things to me are a signal of a strong culture because the people that leave don't actually leave entirely. They're always around. They're always there to help out and, and assist. Um, having fun. I firmly believe that work should not just be work. If you are going into work every single day and you aren't having at least a little bit of fun, you're probably not getting the maximum uh, value out of your, your position or, or your role in the organization. Um, strong cultures encourage people to have fun. They encourage people to get together. They encourage people to uh, set up social events. Um, and in that vein, they also tend to support uh, community involvement. Things like volunteering, things like um, engaging in an open source community. Uh, even if there's not a, a firm, solid, you know, defined corporate social responsibility program, you will see in places with strong cultures uh, groups of people doing good, good deeds when they have the opportunity in most organizations. There's a few that don't. Uh, <clears throat> It also affects the bottom line, right? And this is, this is the business side of things. Um, when you have a good, when you have a strong culture, um, you automatically are creating a, an inefficiency um, because people are not struggling to uh, fight through the conflicts that having a loose culture might have. Uh, they're focused on delivering value. They're focused on doing the things that actually move the needle rather than trying to work through office politics, right? Um, you also lower your operating costs. When you have strong relationships between the people in your organization, your costs overall go down, right? You don't have HR, you don't have as many HR complaints. Uh, you don't have, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you, don't, you lower your overall operating costs. Uh, and then finally, more buzz is, means you get better hires. When you have a strong culture, when you have a defined culture, when you have a culture that other people understand and can com clearly communicate, um, you bring in higher quality people who can perform within your culture. If you think about the lists of the best places to work that we all see every single year, right? Those top 10 companies aren't differentiated on the product. They aren't differentiated on the market. They aren't differentiated on their profit. They're differentiated on their culture. The number one places to work are, the pl are rated the number one places to work because of their culture, not just because of the business that they do. Um, if they didn't have as strong of a culture, they would not be as at the uh, at the top of those lists. So, that's my spiel on what culture is. But you're not here to just hear about that, right? I think we all have ideas about what culture is. What we're here to talk about is change. And the first question is, why do we want to change? It's it sounds like a really simple thing, but it's actually kind of complicated. Um, there, I was thinking of different reasons, different different uh, uh, fundamental points. Uh, on why we want to change culture. One, one of those is agility. And I don't mean uppercase agile scrum Kanban. I mean lowercase a agility. Um, we often want to change our culture so that we can be better at uh, not just doing things, but deciding what we're doing. Um, be faster, be more able to uh, adjust and accommodate new information. We also want to make sure that we understand and can, and can be better, faster about how we position the things that we do. Um, and that's not just about building the product, that's about actually engaging actively in the company. Um, if I need to convince my CEO of something, I know the things that I need to say to him because of the way that our culture works. So if there was a disconnect of culture, if, there, if the marketing team had one culture or one subculture, and the sales team has a totally different subculture, and they're both aligned on different avenues, it's really, really tough for me to get in there and make something happen quickly and, and effectively. I have to fight through all of, the, all of the red tape to make that happen. The second reason we tem tend to want to drive culture change is diversity. And I don't just mean diversity by age, gender, race, religion. Um, those are very important, don't get me wrong. But really, the goal of all of that is having diversity of thought. Um, you can have a culture that appears diverse, that has, that checks all the boxes, that has men and women, that has all different races, that has all different religions, but they can still be dysfunctionally uh, saddled with groupthink. If we're sitting in the office every single day and everyone in the, every meeting is just nodding their heads and saying, yep, 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 I agree, yeah, that sounds like a great idea, we're not, we're not going to ever create something new. 
we're just going to keep doing the same old things in the same way every single time. So when, I'm talking about, when I talk about diversity as a culture change, I'm talking about bringing in different ideas, bringing in thoughts, uh, being open to constructive conflict. There's so many organizations that I know of that don't like the, the thought of conflict. K2 is actually one of them. Um, we're getting better at it. But you know, when people butt heads, things happen, things change. Um, and we will never come up with innovative solutions if we're always just agreeing to what everyone else is saying. We'll always just do the same thing. Uh, sustainability. This is particularly troublesome for companies that don't have a strong culture. Um, brain drains. People who come in for two years and then leave. Um, you never build a sustainable model of your business or your employees unless you have some kind of North Star that they can all connect to. Um, this is actually one of the interesting problems that Amazon has, even though I mentioned them as having a strong culture. They also have a strong culture of people going in for two to three years and just cycling through um, because of the other aspects of the culture that don't fit. But when we're trying to drive change, one of the factors that often drives that is wanting to make sure that we see the same people day in and day out over the course of time, right? That we have relationships that we've built that we can rely on. For product managers, because we lead through influence and not authority, it's really hard if there's a revolving door that people are always going in and out of. If you have a development team where you get new developers every, single si every six weeks and someone else goes out, it's really hard to build that rapport and that trust and respect. Um, but that doesn't just apply to us. It kind of applies across the organization. Increasing profitability is obviously always good. Uh, and that's, that's another, change that, uh, another factor that we often use to change culture. Um, we can see waste in the organization around struggling through red tape, around fighting battles that don't need to be fought, about arguing over things that really aren't effective, aren't effect, that really are affecting our bottom line, but they're hidden underneath the, the, the corners of that, of that broad umbrella of culture. And finally, and I think the most important reason we want, we want to make change is because we want, we want to increase our happiness, right? We're unhappy with something about the company, something about the organization, something about the interactions that we have on a daily basis. And that is what drives us to, uh, to want to change the culture. Basically, we know we can do better. No one ever wants to change culture unless they see a failure in the organization of some form. We always want to change something because we see a better day. We see a blue sky out there. We see a light at the end of the tunnel, to use another bad analogy. Uh, you know, we want, it's not just wanting to do better because that's not enough. It's actually seeing the change and that, or sorry, seeing the future that we want to have happen. But why is it so hard? Like all of those things sound really, really simple, really straightforward. I should just be able to go up to people and say, hey, I'd like to be happier. That doesn't work, right? We all know that. Change is really, really, really hard. Um, and there's a few reasons. So I've got six bullet points I'll walk through. Uh, one is that the perception of change. And when you're talking about changing something like culture, that's not a process. It's not a, it's not a widget that we can talk about. Perception becomes reality. You know, there's not a, it's, it's very difficult to quantify what your culture is. In a, in a meaningful way, and I'll talk about the biggest challenge momentarily. Um, but the perception of change, that fear, that, that, that um, inarticulable nugget in the back of someone's head that, that means, that indicates that they're uncertain, uh, is really, really a strong motivator against change. A lot of people do not like change. A lot of people fear change. Um, and we need to understand that as product managers or as change agents uh, that we are fighting against a primal instinct there. It's not something that people, people aren't thinking, oh, I don't want that to change. They're more thinking, it's not that I don't want it to change, I don't know what the outcome is going to be. So we need to be really clear and crisp about what that outcome is. Um, the other thing, especially with product managers that we will often run into is power dynamics and ego. Um, I've run into this at many companies where the CEO has their way of running things and as the company grows, their way, their approach, their idea of what the culture is doesn't change while the company changes underneath them. And it can be really hard to convince certain people um, who have put their body and soul and blood into a, pro into a, uh, sorry, into a company um, 
that the way they view things isn't what's happening on the ground. Or the other way around, the way they're viewing things, it doesn't mesh, mesh with the rest of the people. You know, the culture of a five-person organization is very different from the culture of a 20-person organization to a 200 to a 500. They necessarily change. And if you just try to impose the same cultural values or cultural rules over those, each of those organizations, it won't necessarily scale properly. So it's really important for us as product managers or change agents uh, to make sure that we're aware of ego and power dynamics in the organization when we're trying to make changes. We need to build coalitions of people. We need to build those relationships so that we're trusted rather than, uh, rather than suspect. Um, <clears throat> another big uh, challenge that we often run into is, as, as we heard all about habits, um, we are creatures of habit, right? We do things the same way every day as a matter of course, without thinking about it. Um, particularly when you're talking about an agile transformation, I've been in several companies where I've done agile transformations, um, this comes back to bite you every single time. Because when stress happens, people revert to those habits because they've worked in the past. And what we're trying to do is actually build new habits and build new relationships in their brains um, so that they're thinking less about uh, the fear, less about the pain, and more about the benefit further down the line. Um, we've struggled with this greatly at K2, actually. It's been really rough to try to go through our agile transformation because as the, you know, the release date comes up, People want to fall back into old bad habits. They want to make sure, you know, they want to, they want to uh, overcommit. They want to, uh, they want to over deliver when sustainability is the key of uh, our scrum practices. And they, they know it. Like if you talk to them, they will explain to you, yes, I understand that we need to have sustainable sprints and we need to match our velocity. And then they will go off and do something different, which is why I wanted to talk about the last one the theories of personality. So I am a psych social major, um, which makes me really happy to talk about this today. Um, but the interesting thing about organizational psychology is there's millions upon millions of pages written about this topic, right? There's been studied for over 50 years. It's, it's, it's insane the amount of time, money, and effort that's gone into, into understanding this. The problem is most of the work here is convoluted. It's contradictory. It doesn't make a lot of sense in practice. A lot of it's theoretical. But a few years ago, I was working with a distress consultant at one of the companies that I was about to be laid off from, uh, <laughs> who introduced me to this, this uh, psychological theory from uh, the late 70s. And what it's called is the espoused theory and theory in use. You, all, you guys actually already know this. I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you ahead of time. You already know this because you see it every single day. So the idea is the espoused theory are the things that we say that we do. They're the things that we say we value. They're the, they're the lip service that we give to the idea of diversity, right? Or, or agility. The theory in use, or theory in practice, as I always call it, I don't know why, is what we actually do. And the amazing thing about trying to push change through an organization is nine times out of 10, what you're really trying to do is bring the theory in use in line with the theory, uh, with the, the espoused theory, sorry. Um, people tend to say the right things, and they may even actually value those things, but they may act in a completely different and opposite way. So, some common examples, your boss has an open door policy, but every time you walk in, they criticize you, right? Why are you wasting my time? We see that all the time. Um, companies that say they're seeking diversity, but when you walk in, everyone looks the same. We see that all the time. Um, this is, a, this is my, one of my favorite ones. You know, we're user-centered, but when we start to get to crunch time, we drop UX features immediately and just work on functionality. Um, pro we're process-oriented, but we take shortcuts all the time. Uh, we value, per this is my personal bugaboo right now, but we're getting better. Uh, we value personal development, but there's never any budget for training. There's never any, any actual programs that help someone develop their, pers their personal skills. Uh, we're all one team, I've heard this one so many times, and yet, you know, the division always throws somebody under the bus. It's always someone else's fault. We can't all be one team and be constantly throwing people under the bus. Um, we value quality, and then we cut corners to ship. Again, crunch time, we revert to type, we just want to get stuff out the door. And my favorite one of all, because I'm an agile coach, uh, are the companies that say we're agile, but really they're just waterfall and just 
iterating every two weeks is another waterfall rather than, rather than doing the cycle of inspection that was talked about by Wade. So there is a, a particular uh, role in every organization that I think is, I kind of, I should not have clicked the button. No. Uh, there's a particular role in every organization that I think is, is primed uh, for driving culture change. And for me, that's product management. And there's a lot of really good reasons for that. Um, one, we tend to make data-driven decisions, or we tend to expect and try to drive other people to make data-driven decisions. This can be a challenge with a soft, squishy, touchy, feely thing like culture, um, but there is data that you can find. There are data points that you can use to explain uh, why the culture needs to change, drive those changes to drive, uh, drive improvement in your organization. We tend to be transparent and we tend to document things very well. Both of those things are super important. Um, one of the issues that we often have with culture change is, is that fear that was mentioned, the fear of the unknown. But if we're transparent about what we're trying to achieve and why we're trying to achieve it and why we think there are problems, then that fear is not based in fact. And we can challenge that fear in an indirect way. Um, documentation, we're, we're good at interviewing people, right? That's what we do. So we can go out within the organization, we can find people that are struggling, we can find people who don't think the culture fits them, and we can find out what it is about that culture that they want to change. We have cross-organizational contacts. Every product manager should, I hope, uh, be able to talk to multiple different, uh, place, multiple different organizations within the company. We should be able to engage with the C and D level, C and D level executives. We should be able to engage with the individual contributors. We should be able to engage with management. That access, in my mind, puts a duty on us to bring these uh, issues to the front, um, because we're the only ones that we're the ones that see the realist picture on the ground. A CEO, even if they're highly engaged, has their own their own blinders on, their own rose-colored glasses. And if we're, we have that access, if we have the ability to sit down with a CEO or a CFO or a CTO or a director, we should use that not just to push our product uh, agendas, but to push our culture agendas as well. It's really interesting when you start talking about culture with some people that they honestly just don't realize where the issues are. They don't understand the, what the problems are. They, they're a lot on the espoused theory side of things. And their theory in practice, theory in use, it's not because they don't believe those things. It's not because they don't actually value diversity. It's because they assume that everyone shares their value. And that because I'm the CEO, everyone is doing the thing that I think they should do. But we all know that that's not always the case. So it's just raising that visibility, raising that, uh, that, that uh, transparency up to the, to the C&D level. We're also very good at holding others accountable. And this goes in with that transparency. It works in with the access. Um, we can and should call people out when their theory and use is not matched to their theory and practice. When you see HR never pushing through female candidates for jobs, right? We shouldn't just accept that. We should call it out. Um, and if we've done our job of building those relationships, if we've done our job of banking all of that social capital, we should have the access and the capability to, to do that. Um, and if you're in an organization that then punishes you for that, then that's probably a, a culture you don't want to remain in, is my opinion. Um, and the last one is leadership through influence. We are used to making things happen without having direct authority. That's what we do. It's what we do every single day. The developers don't build the product we ask them to because they have to. They build that product because they believe that we're directing them in the right direction. Um, sales doesn't bring us along on calls because they need us. Sales bring us along on calls because we've built a relationship with them so that they understand the value that we bring. Uh, we need to leverage that leadership uh, capability in culture change because culture change doesn't actually happen if it's forced upon people. Then you get a lot of theory and <laughs> espouse theory and not a lot of theory in use. Right? Because people will say, oh, yeah, no, I totally understand. You know, we should, we should have more events in the office to, to raise morale. And then no one actually schedules anything because they all think it's someone else's job. Right? 
we need to push that that ability. We need to people. We need to give people the intrins intrinsic motivation to change, not extrinsic motivators. They don't work as well. So I wanted to make sure. Okay, we were running really close. <laughs> Fortunately, I'm I'm able to speed up a little bit. So. I did want to give you guys four things that you guys can do, to, but, well, not tomorrow, because you'll still be here, I hope. Um, but when you get back into the office, there, there are a few things that we can all do, and I, I, I'm going to try to do some of these myself. Uh, uh, one is identify those gaps that you see in your organization between the espoused theory and the theory in practice. What are the things that your organization says they do, but they don't really? Make a little list and kind of follow up on it. It's not something you want to like just run into the CEO's office and go, oh my god, you always say this, but we do this other thing, right? We need to build data, we need to build a case, but think about it and, and, and challenge other people to think about those things. You know, when, when you have a product manager role open up, you know, talk to your boss, ask them about the diversity of candidates that are coming through. Uh, make sure that those, those things are transparent. Um, reach out to people who seem disconnected. This, I, I, I swear I wrote this before any of the events of the past few months. <laughs> um, it's really interesting to actually talk to people who don't engage. So they may have a reason, right? They're, they're, I mean, there are people that just like to go to work and, and come in at 8 and leave at 4, and that's it, right? But there are also people who might want to engage but feel ostracized in some way by the culture. Um, and we, we, as product managers, have that ability and that access. We should talk to people. Say, hey, I noticed you didn't go to that work event, you know, last month. Well, what was up? It might be they couldn't get a babysitter, you know, their parents were flying in, you know, they may have good reasons, or they might just be like, you know what, I just didn't feel like I wasn't comfortable going. Why not? We want to dig. We want to find those five whys. Uh, we want to run our culture change efforts like we run our products, right? We've identified a problem. We think we have a solution. We need to test that out. We need to do the customer discovery process to find out what those problems are. Um, I really think that culture change is just another aspect of what we do as product managers. Um, the third one is a fun one, but essential. Um, go back and challenge your exec's view of, their culture, of the company culture. Talk to them about what they think the culture is and have an open and honest, open and honest discussion with them about the, the things that you've discovered in your first step um, so that they can understand. Because usually, it's, again, it's usually not that people don't um, want a good culture. They, don't, they want a strong culture. They have a feeling and a view of what they want that culture to be. But that doesn't always trickle down. That doesn't always just happen. So we need to, we need to make sure that they're checking themselves. And, uh, when I worked at a, a company called Merson a few years ago, we had a big disconnect between the CEO and the rest of the company. And all it took was a couple of people saying, hey, you know, you, you always say this, but all the other people are doing this. And he finally, like, it clicked in his head one day, and we had some discussions that were productive. Um, there was a little bit of conflict, but that's okay. Uh, and it came out, it, it, it resolved itself in a much better working environment because people weren't fighting against each other anymore. They were all aligned toward a similar goal. And the last one is to lead change by example, right? If we want to change the culture, then we need to live that culture that we want to see. Um, this is probably the slide you were all expecting at that point. Um, you know, be the change that you want to see. I, I don't think that's enough. I don't think it's enough to be the change. I think we have to do it, right? I can live it. I can, I can be the shining exemplar of diversity, but that puts me in espouse theory territory, right? I am saying that I value all of these things, but I have to actually do it. I have to go out, and if I get a series of job applicants who don't reflect my diversity, I have to stop and say, hey, HR, I need more applicants. I can't just go through and say, okay, well, I value this, but because there aren't enough people, then, you know, so what? Uh, I need to go through these, these resumes anyway. Uh, we need to do it. We need to be and, sorry, I just said be. We need to do the change that we want to see in an organization. Um, it's not easy. It's a challenge. It's a struggle. And sometimes it backfires on you. Um, but the reward at the end is more than worth the effort that we're going to put into there. It's more than worth the pain that we're going to have. When you see a company culture coalesce around common goals, common values, common opinions, um, 
it's really amazing the difference that that makes in the day-to-day -day operation of the company. Um, as both as an individual contributor and as a product manager, I love working for a company where everyone wants to be there every single day because they're having fun, because they're enjoying it. I've worked at places where nobody wanted to be in the office. Not at all. And those places were toxic. And I left because I couldn't, put, I couldn't keep myself in that, in that type of environment. Um, but I also regret not doing a little bit more because I probably could have had probably could have had some impact. may not have changed everything, but I might have made a couple other people's lives a little bit happier. And for me, that's really what we're trying to do with culture change. So if there's one takeaway that you, you walk out this room with, it's that you are the agent of change. It's not going to happen if you just sit back and, and, and watch and hope and think and plan. We have to take proactive steps to make the culture change and the culture that we want to see. And that's the presentation. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> yes. Um, so I'll speak loudly to the room. Um, so one area you didn't cover was actually measuring culture. So we use culture IT in, in our company. And as executives, we're actually held accountable. To interesting. Yeah, it's good about it. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's why I said interesting. <laughs> So I think I, if, if you can find a way to measure culture, um, and that, I mean, there's a hundred different ways that you can do that, uh, that helps us because we now have data. Um, and it could just be, a, it honestly could be a simple employee satisfaction survey. Uh, you can do NPS score for your own organization. We do that at K2. Would you, you know, would you recommend K2 as an employer to someone that you know? Um, though I, I would try to keep them very simple metrics. Because, as product managers know, the more complex metrics you have, the less you can measure the impact of any change. Um, so I, I think if you, if you can find a good tool that measures culture, uh, absolutely. It's 100% great. Um, well, it's 100% good. I don't know that it's great. Because like you say, there's, there's still... The challenge with culture is, is the challenge with a lot of other soft things, right? Um, there, it, it's, it's not a simple, you know, zero to 100, where do you rank? It's, it's much more of a, a sliding scale. Um, my fear when people use tools like that is that it gives a false sense of security. Um, and like NPS scores, I'm sure everyone has worked at a company that gamed their NPS scores and only asked the customers that they knew were going to give ratings, give good ratings, right? You can do that with your, with your culture measurements too, right? You can ask the people that you're confident will give good ratings and now all of a sudden, hey, look, everything's great when you're actually just continuing to ostracize people more because you're saying the culture is great, but this guy, you know, this group over here totally disagrees with you. So I, I'd say if you're going to do it, go all in. And it's got to cover the entire organization, and it's got to be, uh, it's got to have buy-in from the top. Yes? Um, I just wanted to actually add a little bit to that. Um, I was in a company where we had five pillars of um, our culture, and every month and every quarter, they would recognize one or two people from each pillar that exemplified that culture pillar. And that's, it, it was really difficult thing to measure, but it was easy for people to Well, I, I think that giving, giving examples of good behavior, right, is always a, is, is always a positive. It, it, gives, it gives that exemplar, even if it's not perfect, even if it's not the absolute avatar of that value, but it, it, 
one, it personalizes it, right? This person has gone out of their way, you know, let's say you have a corporate social responsibility program, and this person has gone out of their way to donate uh, 40 hours of their own time on the weekends, right? That, that gives a very specific picture of what that value is and where it, where it directs, which is, I think could be, could be huge, especially if you're, if you're working with that, you can also make sure that you're looking at the people that are reflecting the culture that you want, not necessarily the culture that you have as well. So if you can find examples of people who are living the culture you want, you can also really, really be effective at using them as examples to push that change through. Any other thoughts, questions, comments? That's really cool. And I mean, it reminds me of a thing I actually didn't mention, but culture comes from organic relationships, right? Our culture, it isn't something that just happens. Um, we have culture in all sorts of different forms in our, in our private relationships, in our work relationships, our marriages, our friendships. They all have a culture to them, but that didn't just happen. It builds over time and it builds through, it builds organically through the relationships that we make. And the more the more relationships we can foster within the organization, the more likely we are to have a cohesive, coherent culture as people share those ideas and thoughts and, and challenge each other. So that's, I love that. I may have to try to steal that. <laughs> I like it. Uh, all right, I think we are about ready for lunch. I'll take one more. Well, I think uh, it's lunchtime. So everybody, thank you for attending. I appreciate it. I'll see you guys around. <laughs>